Typically, and there are always exceptions, uh, one would say, and we frequently say here, that th this course is not for children, so, certainly not for children, and really is not for, for young adults. You know, we're still trying to make their way in the world and still have the illusion that, 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 that doing things this, in this world is important, is valuable, et cetera, et cetera. It's only when you get a little older and you realize that nothing works here. That, <laughs> you know, right? Nothing has worked in your life, let alone anybody else's life, that you're, that you're ready to, to consider, you know, seriously consider a spiritual alternative. Jung had, had, had said actually many, many times that, that one could divide a person's life into two stages. The first stage is basically dealing with the world, and that usually takes you somewhere until your mid-30s. Uh, and then there's a second stage, which then be, becomes dealing with religious or, or spiritual issues. In other words, when people begin to realize that the world doesn't really hold what they, what they thought it held, and they begin to look for some kind of deeper purpose or meaning in their lives. So that it really is our dissatisfaction, our sense of hopelessness, despair, pain, that drives us to really seek a different answer. Right? It's at that point whether one literally thinks of a Jesus or a Holy Spirit uh, or any other symbol, it doesn't matter. There's some recognition that the thought system we've been following or, or that the world espouses doesn't work. You know, uh, in Bill's famous line, to Helen there must be another way. And what impelled him to finally say that to her was seven years of absolute hell, right? In his relationship with her, as well as in their relationship uh, with other people in, on the faculty and uh, on the me medical centers, et cetera. Right? And he finally said, there must be another way because what we're doing is not working, right? And the course, obviously, as you all know, was the answer to that, uh, to their joint request, right? right? Uh, Jesus echoes that uh, in chapter 2 of the text when he says the same thing, that tolerance for pain is very high in all of us, but at some point we say there must be a better way. Right? And in a sense, that's what sets us on the pathway of forgiveness. Rather than digging in our heels at the bottom of the ladder and trying to make the best of our life here, we say there's something very wrong with this picture. And even if I don't know what it is, I know there's something very wrong with this picture. In one sense, one could say that's the only positive factor or use of pain. It could finally impel us to say there must be another teacher, you know, floating around in my mind. So all that's really necessary is that a part of my mind that I'm not even aware of, that that decision-making part of my mind, is already choosing against the ego thought system. It's saying, you know, specialness just doesn't do it. You know, I have everything I want. You know, I tricked, manipulated seduced everyone and everything and got everything I want and I'm still not happy. You know, there must be something else. You know, uh, it doesn't matter what form it takes. You know, the, form, it, the form is nothing, the content is everything. And the content is simply expressing some uh, awareness that the ego uh, is not the only teacher or at least the ego is a false teacher. All right, that's what the Course would refer to as the invitation to the Holy Spirit. It's opening up a door to a mind that, was already, that had been closed. And again, what the Course refers to as, as the right mind. All right? And at that point, we can begin to hear our inner teacher. And obviously, it doesn't, when we say hear, we're not talking about anything physical. You don't have to hear the way Helen heard or anybody else you know, hears internally. It simply means beginning to have thoughts that are different from your ego thoughts. However you express that in form or understand that conceptually is your business. It doesn't matter. Right, but the content is what's important, that you're beginning to look within and opening up your mind to hearing or getting some other kind of message that points you in a different direction. Right, but what I'm going to read to you now would be the content of what you'd be hearing. Projection makes perception. The world you see is what you gave it. Nothing more than that. But though it is no more than that, it is not less. Therefore, to you, it is important. It is the witness, and again, the it is the world that you see, you know, the world of our experience, the way that our relationships, our situations that, that we're in. It is the witness to your state of mind, the outside picture of an inward condition. That's a very, very important phrase. That's what the world is. It's an outside picture of an inward condition. Remember, once again, there is no difference between the inner and the outer. 
you know, the film that runs through a projector is exactly what you see on the screen in the movie theater. Exactly. All right? It's an outside picture of an inward condition. All right? In that sense, the inward condition is what goes on in the projection booth, and the outside picture is what you see on the movie screen. All right? For our purposes here, and obviously this is what, what Jesus is talking about, is the way we perceive the world, the way we experience the world, is a picture of what is inside. As a man thinketh, so does he perceive. Therefore, seek not to change the world, but choose to change your mind about the world. Perception is a result and not a cause. So when I finally throw up my hands in despair and say, there must be another way, there must be another teacher, this is what the teacher says to me. Right? Not so much in these words necessarily, but certainly in the content. The world, the world we experience, more specifically, the world of our special relationships is the royal road to understanding the activities of our unconscious mind, and specifically the activity he's talking about, the only activity there is in our mind, is the decision to choose the ego instead of the Holy Spirit, to understand the guilt that follows from that choice, and then how the world then is the outpicturing of that guilt that we have made real in our minds. And he's trying to get us to shift our whole perspective and orientation from this world to the world of our thoughts. Not the thoughts in the brain, but the world of our thoughts in our mind. Without that, without that redirection of understanding what our perception is telling us, we would have no way of accessing the mind, because we do not know what a mind is. Part of the problem in understanding the mind is that you can't see a mind. The mind existed before time and space. So, so we know about a brain, you could see a brain, you could dissect the organ, and you could study the brain, you could study the cells, you could manipulate the cells, stimulate the cells, you do all kinds of things with the brain, because you could see it, but the mind you can't see. Right? Meaning you can't see it with your body's eyes. Right? And we don't have, have the concepts really for, for mind, because you know, uh, sometimes in workshops, people ask, well, where is the mind? Well, it's not a where question. It's not anywhere. It's not spatially or temporally oriented. There's no reference for it. That's why it's so difficult. You know, just as, uh, as uh, earlier this morning, that I was saying how difficult it is to talk about God. It was, it, for the same reason, it's difficult to talk about the mind because it's, the mind is not of this world. The puppet has no conception of the puppeteer. All the puppet knows is that if a string is pulled, it goes like this. Jerks one hand up, or another jerks another hand up, or throws out a leg, or moves a mouth, and words come out. Well, this body is a puppet. It has no life. It simply does what the puppeteer tells it to do. But if I don't know that, then I would think that the puppets are real. Just as, just as if you take a small child to a puppet show, and the child doesn't understand that the puppets are not real, the child can get very upset by what goes on on stage. And so you cover the child to explain what a puppet is. Right? And that's what Jesus does. We're getting upset all the time by what's going on on stage. Right? And we don't want to hear that nothing's going on on stage. Right? So he has to be very patient and lead us step by step by step, which means really that we, have to, that we only hear the truth to the extent we're ready to open our minds to it. So it's not that he literally leads us step by step. He doesn't do anything. All right. his, his presence is there. We just close the door. So when we open the door a little bit, we feel, well, he's taking another step with us. Then we open a little bit more. But we're the ones who do all the work. We did all the work in closing our mind to the truth, and we have to do the work of opening the mind to the truth. Again, what Jesus does is that he's a, a loving, true presence, a thought in our mind that by its very nature and his very presence in our mind reminds us that there's another path that we can choose. He can't open our minds for us. We close them, we have to open them.